Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us for tonight's event. My name is Kevin. I'm an events host here at Powell's Books. And before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and on our YouTube channel as well. Tonight, we are very excited to welcome Jess Walter and Amor Tolls in conversation, telling an intimate story of brotherhood, love, sacrifice, and betrayal set against the panoramic backdrop of an early 20th century America that eerily e echoes our own time. Jess Walter's The Cold Millions offers a kaleidoscopic portrait of a nation grappling with the chasm between rich and poor, between harsh realities and simple dreams. The Cold Millions is a tour de force that features an unforgettable cast of cops and tramps, suffragists and socialists, madams and murderers. The best-selling novel garnered numerous accolades and is now available in paperback. Uh, tomorrow, I think, is actually the uh, official paperback release date. Jess is joining us tonight from Spokane, Washington. Jess will be joined in conversation by A. Moore Tolls, author of Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow. His new novel, The Lincoln Highway, comes out next Tuesday and has been called, quote, an absolute beauty of a book by Tana French. He's joining us tonight from New York City. This evening's event will also include a Q&A please use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. And if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, you can even upvote other people's questions. Mm -hmm. Perhaps most importantly, please support these fine authors and Powells by purchasing a copy of their books from us. A link to buy The Cold Millions and all the books by both gentlemen will be shared in the chat this evening. Jess, Amor, it's so great to have you here. Good to see you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, for, Kevin. thanks for having us. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, and, and, and you're wise to be here. Uh, we were just talking about the fact that uh, Jess and I have never met. And what ended up what happened is I take a little bit of my summer and say, you know, what are our, you know, five, eight books that have come out in the recent years that I that I wish I had read by now. And, and so, you know, this was one of them. And, uh, and I finished it. And I was like, oh, I was great. And it was, the, I was about to put it back. I was about to put it up on the shelf, you know, uh, next to the beautiful ruins. And I, and I thought, you know, I should, I should let him know, you know, that I like it so much. And so, you know, it's the only, as I said to him, it's the only good thing that Twitter has ever done for me. You know, <laughs> this is, I, you know, as I, I, I was like, yeah, I wonder if he's on Twitter. He is. Then, you know, you sent him a thing. I said, you know, Jess, I love your book. And it's, you know, and by the way, the description that was given of the book for those who have not read it is an, as a very accurate description. Uh, and and, and a, it does it justice in terms of uh, it is an adventure full of all these terrific characters. It has historical weight to it. Um, and it is, and I love the fact that description says that it is both panoramic and kaleidoscopic. Oh, and because that's yeah. a tricky, it is a tricky thing to do both of those things, but it is both of those things. And I'll leave you to dwell on what that means. So, so, so I would like to start the conversation in a way from the back of the book, not a spoiler dynamic, because you right away acknowledge in uh, the aftermath of the book uh, the and I pay tribute in a way to your father and your grandfather as some version of a source for this story, which obviously they didn't not a direct source, but, but a spiritual source. And so I'd love for you to elaborate for us on on those on for each of them. Like what what is the grant? What did your grandfather bring to this creative project for you, and what did your father uh, bring to this yeah. project for you? Well, first, I want to thank you, Amar, for for reaching out and to have a book coming out next week and uh, in the throes of all of your book promotion to agree to do this. Thank you so much. And for me to have just uh, not that long ago finished A Gentleman in Moscow, I didn't read it right when it came out. I have this feeling sometimes if the restaurant's too crowded, I'll wait a year or so. And then my my daughter is studying comparative literature in, in Russian. And so um, we talk a lot about contemporary novels that have to do with, with Russia and the Soviet Union. And I was just so captivated by your book. It was just that immersive feeling. And then a few months later to get an email from the author was just thrilling. So, uh, so thank you for that. Um, my dad and my grandpa. Uh, 
that I think that uh, the phrase you used, a spiritual inspiration, is really true. Um, my grandfather, Jess Walter, um, after whom I'm named, um, had arrived in Spokane in the 30s on a train that he hopped in the Dakotas as a, an agricultural worker. And so for me, it was just hearing stories of jumping on trains. And that sounded so thrilling to a kid who was bucking bales in the 1970s um, to have, you know, my grandpa talk about it, how you'd have to wait till it slowed down, um, you know, just outside of a town and, that, and, you know, how you had to watch out for the rail bowls and all these things. And, uh, and I was a kid who loved Treasure Island. And for me, somewhere in the synapses, jumping a train connected with stowing away on a pirate ship. Uh, and so just those stories that my grandfather told, but, but I think I also, you know, come from a working class family. I'm the first male in my family uh, to graduate high school in my direct line. Um, my other grandfather, my mom's dad was also an itinerant worker in the thirties. Um, he was displaced by, um, by the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, made his way to California, lived in labor camps with his sister and his mom, and, um, uh, and ended up dying when a crane fell on, on him in his 40s. Uh, my dad worked at an aluminum plant for uh, 35 years. And so, uh, and, and he, my dad was a... Uh, even though he had a ninth grade education, he rose to the president position of his union, of his labor union. And growing up in this labor family, you know, my dad's one rule was fairness, that you bring everybody up, that everyone come along. And so to write about my city at this period and to focus on the free speech movement and labor the way I did was to kind of honor the way my dad looked at the world, which was, um, if you're helping the least of us, then you're helping all of us. And really simple message, but it felt like a way to wade into kind of the politics of now um, with a much more elemental story, I guess. And, um, and so they, they were both inspiring in that way. I'm writing about you know, a full generation before uh, my grandfather was even born. So I'm clearly writing about a different time, but that sense of adventure that, that um, and my dad used to hop trains too, and the sense of adventure that they talked about um, was the one that I, I started the novel with. You know, and I think that I, I learned this sometimes from your book, but then it was one of those things, every time I mentioned it to somebody else, they'd say, you know, and I don't think I knew or remembered how active and central Spokane was to union movements nationwide, to, to sort of the, the birth of the union movement. How did that come about? Why was it? Why was it Spokane and not you know Brooklyn or or, or you know or yeah. Detroit or whatever you know I don't know whatever uh, San Francisco. Yeah, there's, there's this whole period between 1907 and 1916 when there are free speech um, uh, protests and riots from San Diego to Sioux City, Fresno, Denver, Minneapolis, Massachusetts. But Spokane was the place was the biggest one, and it was really the the most significant labor victory. And most of the people in my city don't know that. You know that 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 this is a sort of um, progressive point along this timeline, um, a place where through the 1930s, if you you know, said Spokane, you might, you know, get, um, you know, a clap on the back and, uh, you know, and someone saying, you know, the, from, uh, from the, the rising communists and from the progressives of the time. Um, and the reason was, it's, it's pretty simple to visualize if you think of the railroad as the internet. The railroad connected the country the way the internet has recently. And when you and and when the railroad came west, whether you're coming through Montana or through Utah, you got pinched in, in between the mountains. And so seven major rail lines passed through Spokane um, because of the incredible wealth in Montana with the copper mines and the silver mines in Idaho. Um, timber in, in both places, the agriculture of Eastern Washington. Spokane just had 
hundreds, sometimes thousands of itinerant workers. Um, one of my favorite bits in the novel was this distinction between people who, who bummed around like that, that a bum wanders and drinks, a, a tramp wanders and dreams, and a hobo wanders and works. And Spokane was hobo central. Um, that that's where these workers came. Um, so much of the downtown was was flop housing for them and itinerant housing and boarding houses. And so because of the thousands of workers here, the IWW really picked it as a place to make a stand in 1909. Um, they had been banned from speaking on the street. No more than three people could gather um, to speak on the street, and that was to keep these labor organizers from organizing itinerant workers. The things specifically they were protesting were job agencies, job sharks who would take a dollar from a, a, a floating worker and then send them out to a job that often wasn't there or was only there for a short time. Fire that worker, take another dollar and send another man. Um, they would churn through, one mine churned through 3,000 workers for 50 jobs in one summer that way. Um, you don't have to pay someone very much. Um, you never have to give them a raise. You pay beginning wage. Um, it, you, you don't have to pay as much for food or, or housing. Um, and that way it was, and so that's what the, the industrial workers of the world, this nascent union that even it really in its time was completely um, revolutionary. At the time, most unions represented certain ethnic groups, um, no women, certainly, um, no Native Americans or, or African Americans would be allowed um, in, in a carpenter's union or a bricklayer's union. The IWW represented anyone. They would organize brothels. Um, they would organize sex workers at the time. And so that, and, and many of their, of their leaders were like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in the novel, were women. And so, um, yeah, that, that, that's how this movement lands in Spokane. And then because Spokane was still sort of this frontier town and, and had um, a, a very rigid sort of uh, authority within its establishment, they put down the, the protests in an especially violent way, arresting almost 500 people. And um, yeah, I, I, I don't think you were alone in not remembering or not knowing that historical moment. I think it sort of slipped between the cracks. And most people in Spokane, it's been one of the really thrilling responses is getting emails from all over the country from people whose families um, lived here during that time or <clears throat> someone who had an IWW red card but would never talk about it, um, you know, was, um, was hearing all of those all of those old stories come back. Let me ask you this, because the, the, I, I grew up in Boston and I live in New York City. I, I, my brother lives in Seattle, but I'm a, I've, I've been a Northeasterner you know, my whole life. And, uh, and I couldn't help but in reading this, um, think about the narrative you know, in some distant cousin to you know, the poetry of Robert Service, to the mm -hmm. stories of Jack London, who actually you use as an epigraph at one point. And this sort of this, uh, you know, for us, you know, in the Northeast, you know, we, we, we romanticize and but this, this version of the Northwest, and that it wasn't the cowboys, you know, that's sort of the, that that's a different American uh, mythology or, 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 or storyline, there is this one in the Northwest, that's very particular and, and, and this, your book felt very much of a piece with that, you know, that it was sort of an extension of these rough American stories uh, of, of these towns, boom towns and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and hard weather and, you know, those kinds of things. I, so I was wondering, did you, it feels that way. I don't, I didn't know whether you, whether that was something you were, you were thinking about consciously, uh, you know, what to capture in a way the sound yeah. that would, have been, would have been appropriate to the story of 1907 Spokane. Definitely. Um, the, you know, a lot of the books you read for that time just sort of, um, so this Rebel Voices, uh, uh, an IWW anthology, and and you're just reading the songs and the, the you know, the, the personal stories. And, but I think there's also a through line through Walt Whitman and through, um, certainly through Steinbeck, you know, this idea of kind of the big, um, arms around America right. feeling that um, that I also was trying to evoke. Uh, I also read a lot of, of, of proletariat literature and um, 
and found most of it so deadly boring that uh, one of the things I wanted to do was try to avoid that. But yeah, I, I, yeah, I, th I think there were so many. I do think there were these different threads I was trying to include, and that and that Northwest thread is definitely um, one of them. And I don't. The literature of the Northwest is not as um, you know, maybe not as well known, uh, certainly from that time, you know, a, a writer like, uh, um, uh, like Richard Hugo, I think, um, you know, uh, really captures the sort of, you know, it's, it's not the openness of the plains. It's, it's, um, you know, I, I always thought Ken Kesey's novel, Sometimes a Great Notion, captures the feel of, of the forests around you. It's another kind of labor novel. And, and that combination of iconoclastic um, people coming into into um, you know really one of the last frontiers that America had you know until until they ran out of land. I I, I do think some of that um, I hoped to capture. Um, I also I also was very conscious of writing about that period though and it feeling a little bit like a western. I wanted those big archetypal characters, yes. and um, uh, you know used to joke that that it was a Western. I grew up next to a drive-in movie theater. And so I saw all of those spaghetti Westerns and um, and where a stranger rides into town and having my stranger be a 19-year-old pregnant labor activist felt like, to me like the great, <laughs> the great trick of a Western. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the book, for those of you who have not read it, there there is a blend of, it is a work of fiction as, as Jess makes very clear uh, in the afterward and, and, and we as readers can sense that. But there are historical figures that uh, appear through it and that add this sort of great texture to the book. Um, and so I, I guess my question for you as someone who has dabbled yeah. in, in, in different eras and you know, where I've mashed together the made up and the, and the factual, you know, uh, is, is how do you think about that? So in other words, when you, you, must, have, you must have had a hundred actual people that you could consider including, you must have had, you could have had 30 fictional people that you were yeah. thinking about pursuing the thread. And, and then you start to assemble the cast as it were, you know? So, so how did you decide kind of when to draw in a historical figure, how to bring them in, who, who did you, you know, how'd you bring, I was wondering if you could sort of give an example or two of, of, of how you came to that consideration. Yeah, I would love to hear how you do that because <laughs> that, that, that honestly stumped me for the longest time. Um, I'll start with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who is, in many, even though she's not the protagonist of the novel, I would argue is the hero. She is um, and was very much the hero of what happened in Spokane. Um, came in after the police had arrested those 500 protesters and almost single-handedly um, turned the tide of, of public perception, mostly by going out and giving speeches until she was arrested. Once she was arrested, um, the people of Spokane, you know, she'd spoken to garden clubs and women's groups, as well as uh, every, um, you know, uh, every group that would have her. She'd gone around the Northwest raising money for this. And, and it was almost like this had gone too far. She also um, uncovered some really unseemly corruption in the jail and then wrote about it. It was an act of real, of journalism. So because that real thing had happened, I, as a journalist, as a former journalist, I, and as someone who felt like this should be more, this should be better known in the Northwest, in the world, I felt a real responsibility to present her side of the story um, uh, as fully and completely as I could. One of my favorite novels of all time is Ragtime by E.L. Doctorow. And the thrill I would get reading that book when Houdini would appear or, um, you know, I, I wanted that sort of brush against the real to, um, uh, to amplify the stakes of the story. Um, it, 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 I think it, it almost, you know, the, the, the idea that you're going to be, that you're going to be hewing toward uh, real history, I think, puts, um, puts real pressure on the fictional as well. Um, you know, what happens to those characters. And so with Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, I did invent some dialogue, some scenes. She she never did go to Taft, Montana, that I know of. But I so wanted to write a scene in the in the very real, um, hard, uh, hard, dangerous camp of Taft, Montana, that uh, I had her go there. And um, but most of what of the other things she did are are pretty straight, you know, from 
from the historical record. Um, another one, John Sullivan, who was the police chief. Uh, the novel begins with, um, with the murders of two police officers and those really occurred. And, um, and as the person who sort of took the blame for um, what happened in Spokane, it was, a, it was another character that I wanted to represent as um, fully and realistically as I could. Again, um, you, as a novelist, you're, you are inventing all the time. Uh, and so I'm very careful in the acknowledgements to ask readers to treat them as, as fictional characters as well. But, um, but in writing the novel, I wanted their stories to be almost fence posts around this other thing to kind of, you know, contain uh, the fiction with, with a sort of non-fictional um, barricade. Now, I think if I was writing about something a little more well-known, um, I might not choose to that. Um, I felt a real responsibility to this story and to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and to um, this sort of forgotten piece of, of labor history that, uh, that I wanted to honor in that way. And to, I understand your point about if it was a, something that everybody knew, you have to choose more carefully and, you know, and then you're in a, in a very different game. Well, and, I, I, and I might be all right making, you know, Abraham Lincoln a zombie killer or a vampire yeah. hunter um, because, no, you know, the, we know the real Lincoln. It's, um, you know, yeah. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Right. And you were a journalist as a younger man. And so you have that kind of, you, you have some sort of, of relationship to reality, which is, which, which probably I don't have, you know, <laughs> which, which, which is good and an honorable one at that, at that. Um, but, but I think I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, it took me a while to realize that I wasn't going to be breaking news in any of my novels, which was, um, you know, I, I, I almost felt like I, there had to be some reason for them to exist, you know, outside of the narrative. And, um, but, but, you know, once I was through it and and I realized how many novels I loved were historical fiction, were, you know, that loose um, idea of pegged to some moment in history. Um, I realized that there was something I loved in journalism that I love about the research of historical fiction too. That, that you know, that it's the, the, the imprecision of daily journalism makes fiction look, um, you know, uh, makes fiction look really concrete. You're, you are, you are grasping, trying to find things, trying to, you know, paint this thing. And coming back 110 years later as a, as a fiction writer um, employs some of those same skills in a way. You're still trying to gather this information and present it in a way that, um, uh, you know, that, that does more than just, you um, witness what happens but but explain it i guess yeah you know i think the other thing about that is you know war and peace we read it that was not tolstoy's generation you know right. that was that was yeah. his parents generation really who went through the war of 1812 he was just he was a kid you know at yeah. most yeah. and you know uh edith warden's age of innocence that's not her generation that's again her parents and grandparents that she's interested in investigating George Eliot's Middlemarch is the same thing. It's not Jack, her. Jack story. London is writing stories from, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, this thing of you looking back and you inherited some strands of, of uh, thematics from your father's union life and labor, you know, life and, and your grandfather's, you say, in this world. And I understand you're going, you know, back a hundred years or whatever, but but it's coming from that place of, of you have a personal stake in this. You know, you've inherited some sense of these times or of important aspects of these times. And so I think it's very natural for, for uh, in a way, you know, that to, to you can have an author who says, "I want to write about," you know, "I'm John Cheever, and I'm going to write about the, you know, the cocktail party in my house," you yeah. know. Right. But you know, but you can, but I think it's very natural, as I say, for a writer to look down sort of the thread of, of what they've received themselves and yeah. and it, interest in that. It's interesting having just uh, taught um, a couple of years ago. I uh, was a. Uh, I get was a guest uh, lecturer at uh, University of Iowa in the writing program there and loved it. And but the, there is a sense, you know, right now auto fiction um, uh, is, you know, is uh, really one of the predominant modes, I guess, of fiction writing. And yes. I mean, um, Carl Cano of Aus Canals Guard. No, Carl yes, Oldman. right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, Rachel Cusk and people. Right sort right. of investigating their own lives under a microscope. Yeah. And I, I can remember when it, I think I was 
three or four manuscripts in before I read um, a work that didn't have the the, the um, name of the of the author as a character too, you know. And so, um, and and I really appreciate. I love this movement. It's to me, it seems I, having read a fan's notes and you know, and um, books on through uh, through time, it's it, it it isn't as new as it feels. But but I but that impulse to write autobiographically to me surprises me in the way you're describing it. it it bubbles up in other stories that I look at in the in the way that I view it um you know it, it uh in the things I find important and the things I find interesting and the you know in the very characters that I choose to include I will bump into something autobiographical um and almost always be surprised you know yeah. um, interesting you know. um one of the key uh, stylistic and structural aspects of this book mm -hmm. is is tied to voices in the sense that you start the book and and it, and you well it, you know, it, I guess it's, it's revealed very early on but but there are central characters told in a third person narrative and that we're following but then there are in essence interruptions I don't, you know I don't know whether they're, they're sort of intentional interruptions where we suddenly get a glimpse of uh, we get the voice of a very different of a person you know, who's going to be either central to the story or peripheral to the story, but we hear them and we see their experience, which may be an experience that is, is in the same time as these events, or it may precede them, you know, so, so there's a little bit of you take this beautiful liberty with sort of suddenly threading in these, these variety of voices. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I was thinking, I, I know you're not drawing on it, but I, you know, I was thinking like Dos Passos, or, you know, where you have this kind of, yeah. this great sort of quality of sort of collaging the whole group together. Um, yeah. But I, I was interested in the evolution of that for you. Was that something that, did you start and say, this is going to be a third person narrative, and then they started crowding in? Did you start and say, I'm going to tell this from multiple perspectives? I mean, so what was the evolution of, of kind of how, and then how did you choose the various voices, et cetera? You know, kind of walk us yeah, through. I, li I like you mentioning Dos Passos because I, I was very much thinking of those big social novels and how they feel teeming. They feel teeming with, and and uh, and this is one of my early inspirations for the novel. This is a postcard of my hometown, downtown Spokane, um, yeah, in 1910, right around the time I write about. And those teeming streets, those, and this is not a parade. This is just um, the city, and and that uh, I, I wanted the novel to feel teeming in that way. I wanted it to feel. Um, again, Whitman-esque, these people just sort of falling in. I, I, uh, my inclination as a writer is as a structuralist. I like scaffolding. Um, and I sometimes put the scaffolding up and it becomes the building. And um, so as I was writing this novel, there were, uh, and I also, um, like you, like uh, homages to the, to the novels that I love and yeah. you know, including them right in the text, you know, yeah. like, um, uh, the, my, the, my thrill at reading uh, War and Peace and a gentleman uh, in Moscow um, and, and the, all the other uh, Russian literature was, you know, that was one of the great thrills of reading that. But uh, I, so early on, I, I saw as the central motif of this story, the Spokane River, which is such a dominant feature of the city. So I kept imagining the, the narrative as the river itself as this third person narrative following Gig and Rye. Um, but then I would imagine these undercurrents coming in, these tributaries. And as these other stories came in, they would change the flow of the river. They would increase it. They would pick it up and yeah. um, pick up the pace. Um, I also began, you know, I was writing about 1909 and realizing how many of these characters were no longer alive. And um, it also gave me, I also am driven very much by writing challenges and I had never written a character all the way to the, to their last moment on the planet. And so that became a writing challenge to write some of these people until the moment that they died. And, um, and sometimes all it takes is having never done something before to make me decide that I have to do it. And so those tributaries, you know, would kind of end often um, within the novel. And it became for me joyful writing those stories. Um, some of the characters, there's a quite bad guy named Del Delvo, um, who is Crazy. a pink prince. Yeah, who was so fun to write that, um, you know, that, uh, uh, that, it really felt to me like it was enriching the story and not just 
um, you know, one of those writerly flourishes that you do, you know, that so that your friends will tell you great job, you know. Oh, it's gripping. And and when he meets is it Reston? Uh yeah, early Reston, yeah. And they when yeah, when when Delvo it comes a comes a, a foul of Reston. That's you know yeah. that's yeah. amazing. It's an amazing scene. Thank you. Yeah. And he was riveting. It, a couple of those characters, he and Ursula the Great, um, you know, I had written about them and thought about them so long that they just felt like they announced themselves. And it was, it was like you've cast a movie and the and the, these smaller parts just take over, you know. But they, yeah, De Dell was great fun to write, and and one of the great joys of this book was language, was playing around from the very first ten years ago, fifteen years ago, whenever I first made a notation about this, I wrote in my journal that this would be my great Bindlestiff novel. Um, you know, Bindlestick being the tramp who carries his things in a in a bindle over his shoulder, and um, and then just that language, the skid, the tenderloin, the hurdy gurdy, floaters and tramps and wanderers, and um, a two man misery whip and pounding wedges and curfs and burlap and boxcars. It just felt like a kind of poetry. And when I got to the character of Dell, especially because when I realized he would be a nineteenth century. Um, British Pinkerton detective um, that sent me reading old 19th century British mysteries looking for you know words like lobcocked and prig pipe and mutton shunters and um, and my favorite the morbs which is a feeling of deep unease um, that uh, that that um, Dell has the minute he arrives in Spokane you know that Spokane right. gave, gave me the morbs. Um, we are going to have shift to questions in a few minutes so i just want to remind people that if they are if they would like to ask a question to go ahead and put it into the q a function in zoom as opposed to the chat function um so but before that uh money you know honor betrayal that seems to be like a thread going through this and, you know can you sort of I and mean, then right down to individual coins and dollars that play, you know, critical roles, uh, you know, in, in the decisions of individuals and, and the regrets and, the, and you know, the situations they find them in. Can you, can you talk kind of about that, kind of the, the, the currency and the economy that kind of runs through this as a story? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think it, it's interesting because, of course, money is theoretical. It's not real in a way. And, you know, the and and yet one of the things that drove my interest in the book from the very beginning was income inequality. And I wanted to be able to write about it, but not just throw another log on the Twitter fire. And uh, I wanted to write about it in a really elemental way. And so, um, you know, that though, when you are poor, because, and I remember, because, you know, I, um, I was a, a 19 year old dad working three jobs um, who took a newspaper job to support himself. When you're poor, money has such value. The, the physical thing itself, it's not theoretical. Um, you know, the idea that, that there are, you know, that billionaires were worth, have doubled their money are now worth $1.4 trillion. That, you know, the, um, that's just a number. It's just, you know, it's just a pie chart. But but when you have a hundred dollars and it's your last hundred dollars, it really means something. So Rye walking around with a $20 note in his sock, um, you know, the weight of that, the dollar that you had to spend to get a job. Um, it's funny, money is more meaningful the less of it you have in a way. Um, and and I think, you know, and that's what that's what it was about. There's also a moment where early Reston in the novel. Um, you know, essentially tells Rye that says this is about money for you too. You know, you want you want that same dollar, and and I feel like that was, um, yeah, that was something that sort of arose from the characters, but became one of those philosophical touch points that you that you realize as you're writing. Can you talk about your process? You just mentioned notebooks 15 years ago or whatever it was, or you know, can you walk us through? kind of your process from idea generation to selection, what you're going to write next to then, you know, are you an outliner? Are you a, you know, do, do you make a chapter perfect and move on? Or do you revise the whole thing when it's done? We you know what, right from the beginning. 
I, I almost hesitate to talk about my process because as soon as I do, I violate it in some. Yep. Okay. You, know. <laughs> like, you should lie then. This is this is a good yeah. chance to lie yeah. about your process. Well, I I found myself telling my old you know the way I used to work, but I don't tend to outline. I I um I I am very much a voice writer, and when I find a voice I like then I just keep going. I, at, at about a third of the way I outline, and when I called myself a structuralist, it's almost to just contain those multitudes and find a way you know, to build something that I can put all of this in. And um, so I do sort of outline after I'm about a third of the way through and I start envisioning it. Um, and then I, I look for a sort of artificial um, structures. You know, War and Peace has five sections in an epilogue, so I thought, my book should have five sections in an epilogue, you know. Um, uh, and then, and then the great joy of writing an epilogue, which felt like such a subversive thing to do because it's so old-fashioned in a way. So I, I, um, there, I, I read a quote from Richard Richard Powers where he said, "Someone asked, do you get lost in your research?" And he said, "No, I get found in my research." And I, I so love that about research, but I sometimes feel that way about structure too, that I will have all sorts of meandering and rambling. And then I find the story when I start envisioning it as a river, or I start thinking it's going to take place over a hundred years, like a hundred years of solitude, or, you know, it's, it's almost those things that, that kind of allow me to finish it. As far as the writing itself, I, I do keep a journal and I jot notes in it all the time, but I type my old high school basketball coach was a typing teacher. And so I took three years of typing and type much faster than I can write uh, longhand. Um, and, then, and then I craft chapters, I'll, you know, write things, take them out. I can't really go forward if I think something is terrible. I'm not a draft writer. Um, and I tend to go back and go back and go back. And then when I type the word, last word, I do what a Vegas dealer does. And, um, clear the decks and then I always have to go back and rewrite it five times but I yeah. like the, I like the illusion that um that when I finish it and so a novel like Beautiful Ruins I worked on for about um, 10 or 11 years and I can write two or three things at once I'm writing short stories often and starting other novels and then um but then went back to it and finished and um uh and that you know that feeling of of writing the last sentence when when the book is done is one that I really crave. When, and and it, I think it's artificial, but I, I like to pretend that that's how I write. So I'm, gonna totally, you? I'm gonna totally do that dealer thing from now on in my dad. <laughs> totally. It, you know, if, I think if you do it to your editor, they, they can't change anything. I think yeah, it's, it's way, changing your contract. Are you, are you a draft writer? I was wondering that um, because I, I, think of, I think your stuff is so um, aesthetically perfect you know but it, it, it other writers might just think that of other writers but it it, it feels so well formed that I, I wondered if you were a draft writer I mean I share with you the structural thing I'm very mm -hmm. I mean I, I can't I, 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 I operate better where it has this clear structure and, and the structure can be radically different every time but but I know the realm in which I'm operating yeah. and uh, and yes I'm a I'm an I am an I am an outliner and then a reviser you know, and I'm just constantly trying to work to get the thing yeah. towards, you know, what I think it should be, you know, page by page. I, I was thinking about, uh, I'm going to steal the microphone just for a second, because I think it's because I think you'll think, you'll think it's funny is, is my new book uh, is set over 10 days. And I was, you know, I, I there it is, the Lincoln Highway. Thank you. Uh, so it, it's the whole story takes place over 10 days. And, uh, and it's these 18 year old kids who kind of get themselves into trouble a little bit. But at any rate, in the 50s. And uh, I was about halfway into the book and it was fully outlined. I knew everything was going to happen and all that stuff. And I was, and I had, I hit one of these moments where I'm like, I, I it didn't feel right. I didn't know. I didn't, it didn't feel like I was going in the right direction. It felt like it was bogged down. I was having a loss of confidence and, uh, you know, it was really troubling. And, uh, and so you kind of, as you know, you walk away from that for a minute, you know, and, uh, and the way the book was structured is it said, it was 10 days. So it's a day one, day two, day three, day four. And, and then you would have sort of different chapters under day one as you hear from different people in each day. And um, I was, after several things, 72 hours of torturing myself over, over you know, is this even going to survive this book? Yeah. You know, is, is I was like, you know what? Oh my God, I, I know. This, the book isn't day one, day two, day three, day four. It's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. That's what it is. 
Yeah. And so, so I went back and I didn't change the order of anything. I just yeah. changed where it says day one to the word 10, where it said day yeah. two to the word nine. Because yeah. what it really was, was a countdown. I mean, that's what was in the book, you know, and, and that gave me the kind of the permission to go back to the beginning and rethink everything through that lens, you know, and, 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 I, and I was very small, small changes that I had to make to bring it into alignment with that. But then also when I hit back to the middle point, I knew exactly where I was going. Because we were isn't going that, to four, we were going to four, three, two, one. You know. Yeah, and isn't that fascinating how you stumble upon something like that, and it becomes a, um, it suddenly becomes um, like a compelling thing in the novel. Like now you have, I mean, the, you're, you, it is a countdown. You're just think of the building suspense that that creates. I, I, I had my novel Citizen Vince was going to take place over seven days, seven days, seven days, and then I realized shit i need an eighth day and um and it and it it was so hard to think no but a week is a perfect unit and no yeah. reader has ever said to me it would have been better if it took place over seven days instead it reminds me of the mel brooks and the 15 command oh and he drops one of the tablets i mean these 10 commandments you know? right, right. Yeah. uh yes those that's a hard thing to give up i know just that feeling you know because you you get married to seven it feels yes. so good it's the Hebrew number for infinity. Isn't right. it? Yes, exactly. I mean, come on. Yeah, but uh, there, but yes. there are eight dwarves. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. But then, you know, it's all right. It's going to work, you know. Yeah. yeah um, exactly. Somebody actually was asking uh, here, and we have questions in both formats. So sure. bear with me. Um, one of the questions was about, uh, are you going to, are you still doing short stories? And, and can more short stories be expected from you? Yeah, I have a story collection coming out next year called uh, The Angel of Rome, and that title story is actually available right now. Um, the actor uh, who you just worked with, who just uh, did um, The Lincoln Highway, Eduardo Ballerini, who is the Laurence Olivier of audiobooks. Um, Eduardo uh, did Beautiful Ruins, and he and I uh, collaborated on a story set in Italy in uh, the 1990s called The Angel of Rome. Um, and it's available on, on Audible right now if you're an audio listener. But otherwise, the, the book of stories will be out next June. I just turned it in. So, um, and, that, and for a structuralist, a book of short stories is a kind of special nightmare because it's like an album where none of the songs fit together you know um the other analogy i keep thinking of is it's like a garage sale you just put out everything you happen to have you know and hope that people like it but um but yeah i i do continue to write short stories i love that form and and it's a good way especially when i'm working on a novel a good way to finish something you know because the as you know that that long process of a novel can you know can make you feel like you're you're deep in it forever do you write stories also i do i do and i'll have a collection of stories at some point but i you know yeah. but i yeah but i'll be working I'll be, i'm going to do a novel next so i, I, I was i think my first collection came out out after my fifth novel um which yeah. felt about right it felt like it had taken me that long to compile and there were stories i was sure would go in there and then casting them out you know for better ones was kind of thrilling it's sort of like the rock and roll greatest hits thing. You know, you got to, you got to, you got to, you can't have yeah. a greatest hits album after three albums. You got to yeah. right, have at least five or something. I did, I did sort of feel like my, my first collection, I was afraid it would be called my, my greatest hit. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I did manage to pull enough stories for it. There you go. Uh, one of the questions comes from uh, Meredith, who was asking in, I think in, in the, in harmony with our conversation earlier, what was it like? including Richard Burton in Beautiful Ruins, kind of as a parallel to the historical Yeah, thing. that's, yeah, that historical question. Um, it's interesting that, it, you know, at first I didn't know if I would do that. It felt sort of audacious. And then, and then I started researching him and it was such a fun voice to write that um, I almost, I was afraid I wouldn't get him out of the novel once I put him in there. Um, I, I felt a little bit of, not to give away too much of the plot, but, um, it sort of insinuates that Richard Burton could have had a child out of wedlock. And, um, you know, and there's no evidence that he did, but um, at some point I, it, it was not for lack of trying. And so, uh, um, so I had created this entire fictional story about uh, a woman on the set of Cleopatra. And, and then wildly um, a, a woman came up to, to me at a reading and said, um, 
you know, my aunt was in this very position. She was in Italy with Richard Burton. And I said, you're at it, your aunt is, and I knew the name of the woman because he had brought a mistress to, um, to Italy with him. And then she was rushed out. Um, and, and the story she told me was so close to, except for having a, a child, was so close to Dee's, it was wild. And, um, yeah. and but Great my favorite theory. detail was she said she heard from him years later, she'd married someone else and had three kids and he called and she said he, he still had such power that she would have left if he'd asked her to, she, that he was just so charismatic. And, you know, she, so it was, it was really wild to read someone who'd had a, an experience with, that was so similar, but I, 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 you know, it was, he's, he was just such a great fun character to write. And um, that was one of those characters that I didn't feel bad creating the fiction around because the, you know, the real, um, person is is pretty indelible you know it's um i didn't no one needed me to tell them um about richard burton it was right. clearly fanciful clearly fiction um yeah. and and i also think he's such a compelling figure that um you know that it hopefully comes across that way in the book too uh this is a question uh from an anonymous attendee but uh, all of your books are so different uh Citizen Vance, Financial Lives of Poets, Beale for Ruins, The Cold Millions, are, they're all great, but from different worlds. Can you talk a little about your process in coming to what your books will be about and the voices that accompany them, the distinctive uh, styles? Yeah, I, you know, it's, I, it's funny. I don't ever really think about genre until I'm well into it. And because the, it's, I'm, I feel like I'm voice driven, it's very much the sound that's pushing me along. And then that you know, opens up the characters. I do feel like there's a certain wistful humor in all my work that combines it, but um, it, it was one of the great, one of the great uh, compliments I ever got was at Powell's actually, and a bookstore employee said, um, we never quite know where to, uh, uh, where to file your work, uh, you know, because sometimes it would be crime fiction, sometimes it would be historical, and um, and, you know, I just really write the next book I want to read. And uh, I read all over the map, you know. And so, um, uh, so for me, it's, it, it, it's much less, um, I'm putting much less thought into it than it appears. I'm just really writing the next story that interests me. And, there, and the voice for those stories is going to be as different as, uh, as the subject matter. Uh, this is a question from Laura. Uh, I'm quoting, one thing I admire so much about your uh, book is the well-drawn characters who are native, women, poor. These are the voices that never get to tell their stories and who have been historically left out of narratives. Did you come into the writing of this novel with a conscious goal to include these voices or did the characters emerge more organically and insist on their inclusion? Um, I, uh, I, I did set out to write about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. Um, at around the time I was working on this and just beginning to work on this, um, I told my daughters, I called them this night in November in 2016 and said, tomorrow morning you will wake up and have the first female president. Um, how amazing to live in that world. And they never let me forget it. <laughs> uh, and uh, I was so inspired by the courage and audacity of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. The night of the election, my middle daughter, my both my daughters were out protesting. My middle daughter had a sign that said "Pussy Grabs Back" and was um, was tearing up the streets of Eugene, Oregon. And I was so inspired by their youthful energy and their idealism, and made me think about about the. Parkland shooting survivors and students walking out of school for climate change and Black Lives Matter protesters. The way the way youth is often the leading edge of of idealism and activism. And uh, again, I didn't want to write something contemporary. And I and the idea of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, you know, and this life that my that my daughters could look at. Um, as inspiration, I thought this is, I, sh I need, this is the story that I need to get back to. I'd already, I, you know, it was one of two novels that I was kind of toying with. And so, so that was very much intentional to write about, you know, a city like Spokane that is named for, for the people who are driven from it and not write a Native American character like Jules, um, 
to me would have been a failure of whatever whatever not the novelist's job is. Um, uh, it's also scary to write those characters who are outside your point of view, but I think it's so necessary. I think you have to present the world as it is. Um, as far as the you know writing about the poor, um, I think that's I think I've always been interested in class. I remember in high school being told that The Great Gatsby was the great novel about class. And I thought, this isn't a whole about rich people, you know, this is, this is not a novel about class. Like, um, you know, what, one of my favorite short stories of mine is, is about um, two um, meth addicts trying to pawn a, a giant television. And to me, that's a very different story about class, you know, them coming across a, a giant TV. And we, we, we tend to, you know, the, the upstairs, downstairs world of class um, in, in American literature, we tend to stay upstairs. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I very much like in my work to represent the kinds of, you know, the people who, that I live around or live around me. My last story collection was called We Live in Water because I, I want it to be about us, about we, that, you know, that idea that my dad first started with, that, that, that we lift other people up uh, into the world that we want to inhabit. I mean, this is not a question, but I think it's worth sharing. This is from Mike. Uh, and this is what he says. Having worked at the Bunker Hill Mine as my first job out of college, the class divisions were still there 70 years later. I loved, loved, loved your book, uh, both because I have lived in Spokane for the last 40 years and also the description of the class warfare that still existed in Kellogg when I was there. They still talked about the strikers sending the rail car loaded with dynamite and blowing up the mill when I was there. Um, but it's not, you know, it's, it, as you say, it's it's 100 years ago, but it's it's also, it's barely you know, that, out. That's been one of my favorite things, these letters I've gotten from people who, you know, whose connections are that personal, you know, and um, for th there's a really great nonfiction book, J. Anthony Lucas's Big Trouble. It's a, it'll it'll uh, take up a good few months of your time, but um, that really talks about the mining wars in the Northwest and the Coeur d'Alene's during that period, um, all the way through the assassination of the former governor of Idaho. Um, uh, that's full of Pinkertons. And I mean, it's, uh, it, it's a terrific book for, for people who want to read more about, uh, about that period. But thank you. That's, and um, man, I love, I love Kellogg and Wallace and, uh, and, and that whole area. It's uh, one of my favorite places still to visit. Uh, Rick says, asks, the, the cold millions is echoes of Steinbeck Wallace Stegner and Ivan uh, Duig, uh, for me, for, as the reader. Did any of these people actually influence you, even if subjectively in the stories you wanted to tell? Steinbeck, yeah, yeah. Stegner, and yeah, Duig. No, definitely. Um, you know, uh, Stegner's Joe Hill, of course, I read, and I've always been a huge Stegner fan. It's, um, I think the most obvious influence is, um, you know, probably that, that voice of Steinbeck that I think he inherits from Whit Whitman, you know, which is um, uh, the beginning of Cannery Row, you know, Cannery Row is a poem, a stink, a grating noise, um, you know, the, the gathered and uh, the, I can't think of the scattered and gathered, you know, I, I think that that sort of big poetic American voice used to describe, again, the teeming throngs um, is very much uh, a tributary that I was trying to work in, um, and I think, and I think of Steinbeck less. I think of Steinbeck less in the in the Grapes of Wrath, which is is one of those big social novels, than I think of his um, Monterey Peninsula books. To me, those are the ones that have the sort of humor and the love of of the sort of characters that I also love. Um, so I would say of those, that's probably the biggest influence. I I don't think a Western novelist. Um, exists without Stegner's um, influence, certainly. And Ivan Doig, too, is a wonderful writer who, who updated those kinds of stories. Um, some others that I think, um, you know, I would fall back on that I think of as Northwest writers, um, James Welch, uh, uh, I think, is another writer whose, whose work I hear a lot in my head as I'm, as I'm trying to write. 
I also claim writers like Alice Munro, who lived in British Columbia for a while. So for me, the uh, I can put my Northwest arms around so many different writers. And knowing that your brother lives in Seattle, I may I may start claiming you too. Amy. Yeah, exactly. Feel free. Yeah. Um, can, can you I think can you repeat the name the, the collection the name of the collection of short stories that you already have ha had published? Um, we live in water was the first collection. Sure. Have and you then, titled then, the new one? The new one is called The Angel of Rome. The oh, that, of course, is after the after the lead story. Yeah, yeah. After okay. that main story, which is the the longest story um, in the newest. So, uh, and that's and that's the one that's on Audible now as well. Yeah, yeah, and it was better than my other title, uh, Stories at a Garage Sale, which uh, <laughs> okay. I, didn't, I didn't think the publisher would like. You can come back to that. Yeah, that's I will. Cool. I think that's a keeper. You can you know you'll get a chance to use that later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Three for a dollar. Yeah, we're, we're, we're almost out of time. So I, it seems natural at this point to ask you about um, what what you're working on next, aside from the short stories. I know you, you may not want to talk about it in detail, but you, uh, anything, sort of, how did you decide what you're going to do next? Is it an old idea? Is it a new idea? Can you know, you it's funny. I, I, just, I just saw your By the Book in the New York Times, which is one of my favorite features. I love hearing what other, what other writers, when they ask me to do it, I... Uh, I spent like three months curating my uh, nightstand. I was so terrified because the first question is, "What's on your nightstand?" You know, yeah, exactly, right. yeah, I had to throw, I had to move the Calvin and Hobbes and put something. Uh, but um, uh, but anyway, your your response about you're in a group that reads, um, that's met for 16 years and reads great novels. I'm in a I'm in a Shakespeare club that is actually meeting tonight, and we read all the plays and then talk about them. And it's so much fun. We've been, I think, I think we've been together about seven years and, um, and it's uh, um, uh, three of us are novelists. One of us is, two of us are poets. Um, three of them uh, were Shakespeare scholars who taught Shakespeare. Um, the rest of us are just approaching it as, you know, as sort of civilians. But um, this is a long way to talk about what I'm working on now, but, um, uh, we, you know, it's, we were reading, um, we were reading uh, The Merchant of Venice, and in one of those weird spoonerisms, I called it The Virgin of Menace, and, um, uh, and then I wrote that, and it seemed like such a great noir title that um, for a couple of years, I've been trying to write a book to fit that title, so... Um, Based Great. on the spoonerism of the Merchant of Venice, but uh, I don't even know if that'll end up being the, the title. But I I tend to, you know, that this book will be more contemporary. Um, I want to write I want to write something funny again. I I I just generally love um, humor and work, and so uh, you know whether it's the it's the wry, you know, um, sophisticated humor of uh, of gentleman in Moscow or you know I, I can even go further into Benny Hill land and still uh, laugh so uh, so this one will be funnier more contemporary and if I can pull it off maybe kind of sexy although I don't know we'll see <laughs> we'll that. Yeah. Well, Jess, without, thank without actual sex yeah, yeah okay right exactly yeah. Jess thanks very much uh, for joining me in conversation tonight oh thank you so much Amor I'm so and and we are going to actually meet in New York and have a cocktail in person, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, very soon, in a matter of hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much, and thanks to everyone uh, viewing tonight. Great, lively chat. Lots of uh, questions in the Q and A box, and uh, in the chat right now, I'm going to post a link to our YouTube channel. You can check that out and uh, you can see all of our past events uh, during this COVID era of events. And this event will be going up there uh, probably tomorrow uh, sometime in the afternoon. So tell your friends that missed out uh, that they can watch it there on our YouTube channel. And once again, there's a link to the Cold Millions in paperback. This is the hardcover, the Cold Millions. So big and unwieldy. I wish there was a smaller say, version. Yeah, there will be soon. Uh, Amor, it was so great to have you uh, involved in this mm -hmm. event too. Gentlemen in Moscow, I remember this event uh, here at the store like five years ago. Yeah. Such a great time, a lot of fun. And uh, we hope to see you for your book maybe uh, sometime next year in actual real life person. We'll see. Um, yeah, all right. And you too, Jess. 
Yeah, you're thanks. always always welcome here. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for tuning in, and thanks, Amor and Jess, and everyone. Have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Jess. Goodbye, Amor.